Awesome. Hello, uh, my name is Nick Van Anker. I'm an educator at the MSU Museum and welcome to another one of our fall fossil fun programs uh, that we're doing in collaboration with the MSU Dinosaur Dash and National Fossil Day. Um, we're joined today with uh, a great guest. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Mike Gottfried. Uh, he is a faculty member at in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department. He is the curator of paleontology at the MSU Museum. And uh, today he's got a great presentation for us uh, that highlights some of his field-based research, which is focused Focusing on fossils from the Canadian Arctic. Um, just from what I've heard about this research, it is really, really cool. So I'm very excited to hear more about it. Uh, welcome. How are you doing? I'm fine, Nick. How are you? How are you today? I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited to see about your research. Um, I can see obviously the, the picture of the shark. So I'm very excited to, to hear more about what you got to say. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. And uh, welcome, folks. And thank you for watching this today. Um, so um, as Nick mentioned, I'm involved in a variety of field research projects. And the one I wanted to highlight today is one that, that I've been uh, working with in the last 10 years or so involving fossils from the Canadian Arctic. And hopefully this will be a little bit surprising in the case of what we're actually finding in the Arctic. It's not what you might expect. It's, there are not gonna be polar bears and uh, seals and ice flows really in, in this presentation. It's, it's the Arctic in a much different context. And I think many of you are used to thinking about it uh, and hence the shark. And in the picture, again, you would not necessarily see or think or conceive of a shark but way up in the Canadian Arctic. But uh, as you'll see, that is a, a big part of the story. So I'm going to talk about sharks and other fossil surprises from the Canadian Arctic in the context of what's often been called the polar greenhouse. So we know uh, from, from lots of studies over, over many years that over the now actually billions of years of Earth's history, there have been dramatic changes in the climate cycles, the, the types of environments and climates that the earth has experienced. And a very dramatic one over the last few tens of millions of years is the transition, which is, is well reported by fossils from the Arctic, from what we call the greenhouse earth to the ice house earth. And despite uh, climate change and the warming trend we're in now, the Earth is still in what's considered an ice house phase of its existence because there are still glaciers and continental scale ice masses, particularly Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, so 50 million years ago, if you had gone to the Arctic, uh, close to the North Pole, you might have seen an environment that looked like this sort of uh, temperate rainforest that you see in the picture on the left. Very different from the ice house conditions that still exist in the Arctic today. And this would be really a reflection of conditions about 50 million years ago, which I've abbreviated MA, so I don't have to write millions of years ago every time on my slides. Uh, and over uh, the course of the last few decades, a uh, story has been developed uh, re regarding the temperature fluctuations within the last 65 million years. Uh, so the dinosaurs, just as a, as a, a reference point, the dinosaurs go extinct right about 65 million years ago. And then we advance into the next major phase of geologic time that we're still in. So this green line snaking across this graph shows changes in global average temperature over the last 65 million years. So this is a time scale in millions of years across the bottom of this, of this diagram. Uh, we're right now, in the present day, there is, we are within a warming interval, certainly in, in historic times, uh, but but in, again, in the context of the last 65 million years, uh, it's not nearly as warm as it was during the Eocene interval in geologic time, peaking at about 50 million years ago, this peak that you see here on the graph. Global average temperatures during that time were perhaps as much as 12 degrees warmer on average globally than they are now, which is a very significant number. So a question to ask, and this really is, is also within the context of the impacts of the climate change we're seeing today, is what does the fossil record tell us about the Arctic environment and the climate during the peak interval of what's been called the early Eocene climate optimum, this period of maximum warmth, also often referred to in shorthand as the greenhouse earth, and that again peaking at about 50 million years ago. So here we're looking down on the Arctic, as it might look in winter now, uh, the large, obviously, massive island of Greenland, uh, the islands of the Canadian Arctic, and uh, sea ice filling much of the Arctic Ocean. 
but it would have been much different 50 million years ago. So here's an Eocene fossil forest, not again what you expect in the Eocene, uh, in, in the Arctic. This is at about 76 degrees north, which is one of the last bits of land before you reach the Arctic Ocean and, and get to the North Pole. And these are stumps from fossil trees uh, on Ellesmere Island up in the Canadian Arctic. Ellesmere is a large island just uh, west of Greenland. And this is my good friend and colleague Jalen Everly from the University of Colorado, who's been a prime mover in this research uh, in amongst these stumps. So you have to envision 50 million years ago, rather than this rather dry rolling tundra landscape that's there now, a lush temperate rainforest environment. The work I've been involved in has focused on Banks Island, and you're looking straight down on the top of the on the top of the earth now. The North Pole is indicated by this red dot. Here again is the, the massively large island of Greenland, uh, northern Canada, off on this part of the slide, Scandinavia, northern Europe, and Russia curling around this way. Banks Island, inside this red rectangle, is the, the westernmost large island in the Canadian Arctic, and it's produced a really rich and very significant uh, set of fossils that date back to this peak 50 million year old period of maximum warmth. So here's a better view uh, on a map of Banks Island. Uh, here again are the islands of the Canadian Arctic. Uh, Canada mainland is just a little bit of it in the corner. Uh, this is uh, the northern, northern edge of Alaska. And Banks Island again is a large island. Uh, again, the westernmost large island in the Arctic. Uh, it is part of Canada. And we worked in two areas in the northern end of Banks Island along two different rivers, the Eames River and the Muscox River. And they're both within a large national park called Olivic National Park, which, uh, by the way, has the largest population density of muskox in the world. Uh, so they were our almost constant companions in the field. There were always muskoxen around where we were looking. I have a picture or two of those later. Uh, so this is at about 74 degrees north, which again, very far north, uh, and uh, actually uh, paleo latitude, the latitude uh, a little bit different because land masses have shifted position a bit over millions of years. It would have been an estimated 76 degrees north paleo latitude 50 million years ago. Just an overview of, of what the area looks like. Again, it's uh, maybe not what you first think of with the Arctic. There aren't massive glaciers on Banks Island. It's rather dry, rolling tundra. Uh, this is a close-up of some of the shale exposures that, that occur on the island. And you can see down into the Eames River Valley, uh, which runs through the, more or less the middle here. And then some of the uh, outcrops, uh, some of the areas of geological occurrence that we are interested in, in the hills right along the edge of the river valley, and especially the areas that uh, I think the next slide shows it better that are a little bit reddish in color. So here is a close up, uh, closer up view of a typical fossil locality. Uh, it's pretty loose sand, so you can kind of dig through it actually quite easily. And in fact, most of the fossils that we find are eroding out and lying on the surface. So we quite literally crawl on our hands and knees across these surfaces looking for fossils that have eroded out. And typically they're coming out of these somewhat reddish colored layers, so like the one that you see coming across here on the picture. And this area is in the northern end of Banks Island uh, where you see the red dot on this inset. Uh, the yellow area is the area uh, where the fossil beds are going to occur. So what do we find? Well, surprises, and again, in the context of this being in the Arctic, uh, there's a lot of wood, tree trunks and pieces of fossilized wood. Uh, there are some fossilized leaves. Hopefully you can kind of make this out. This is a large uh, leaf from a hardwood tree. And there's a particular kind of conifer uh, that has a very ancient fossil record called the Dawn Redwood or Metasequoia. And this is, a, there are sprigs of Metasequoia. You see one here and here on this, on this photo, on this specimen. Uh, so again, indicators of a much different climate, a much different environment than we see in the, in the Arctic today. Really intriguing, and this always captures, uh, I think, the attention of, of people who, who are really not expecting uh, to find such fossils. 
the most common vertebrate fossils from, from an animals with a vertebrate skeleton are surprisingly again uh, shark teeth, uh, particularly a particular kind of shark called a sand tiger shark. And you see what its living relative looks like in the picture on the inset of this slide. Uh, so we've, we've found literally thousands of shark teeth, almost all of them belonging to one particular kind of shark, again called a sand tiger shark or uh, the genus Carcarius. And again, thousands have been collected. Again, typically we find them by crawling around on the surface, and they're just sort of eroding out and lying on the surface. Uh, we also screen wash. We have basically a little box with a screen in it. We put the sediment in it and then shake it, and uh, the little bits of some particles of sediment fall out and uh, leave some of the smaller teeth behind. So that's how we found some of the really small things that are almost microscopic in size. And again, they're We've now done over the years three different field seasons, field visits to Banks Island, and collected, uh, I think, again, a staggering number over 8,000 shark teeth from Banks Island. 99 plus percent of these are sand tiger sharks. So we find a huge number of sharks, but a very low diversity. There are a few teeth of some other sharks and, and a, just a very few occurrences of fossil rays, but almost everything you pick up there is a sand tiger shark. So that uh, is intriguing. And then again, we're talking about a latitude of 76 degrees north, uh, very close to the North Pole 50 million years ago. So why such an abundance? Why such a super abundance of one particular kind of shark? Well, one explanation, and we're not necessarily completely convinced of this, but it's, it's an interesting idea, is that uh, this means that, or, or may suggest at least that we find so many sharks of one particular type because they were using this area in the Eocene, again, about 50 million years ago, as a breeding or, as you sometimes say for sharks, a pupping ground. So there were concentrations, aggregations of these sharks during breeding season in this particular area. And this is a photo of actually living sand tiger sharks clustering together in, in that kind of situation. Uh, this is a breeding behavior for them to be clustered together in a tight group like this. This is not a picture from the Arctic. This is a picture from much warmer waters today. We do find bits and pieces on Banks Island of other kinds of fossils. Uh, we find fossil bony fishes, uh, but they're sparse. Uh, shark teeth are, are quite a bit more common. Uh, so we found gar scales. Uh, we found some vertebra, parts of the, parts of the backbone from fish, including a fish called the bowfin or, or anio. And we found scales from pike. So some of you who may fish in Michigan up north may catch pike. Uh, very closely related form living back in the UC, lived up as far north as what's now the Canadian Arctic. So this is a scale, a single scale from a fossil pike. We also found, uh, and this was a nice, a nice not necessarily a surprise, but a, a very nice find because crocodiles are known from other Arctic fossil sites. Uh, we found a single bone, uh, a vertebra from the neck region of a small crocodile uh, discovered in 2012. This is the first croc record from the western side of the Canadian Arctic, so it expands our knowledge of the range of crocodilians during this time period. It's a uh, vertebra again from the neck region. So here on this, this sort of outline drawing of a croc skeleton, it's the vertebrae from roughly this part of the, of the backbone uh, between the neck and the front limbs. It's quite small, um, probably uh, from an individual that was a juvenile when it died, uh, less than a meter in length, maybe in the range of plus or minus half a meter, give or take in size. So reasonable size, but not a full grown adult. So again, to, to put a little bit broader, broader idea of what was happening in the Arctic during this time period, uh, this is a map, again, looking straight down on the top of the world of the Arctic Ocean 50 million years ago. So you can see the familiar land masses, but not exactly in the shape and position and configuration that we're used to thinking of them being in today. So here's North America, again, the large island of Greenland, which was still probably physically attached to North America at that time. 
uh, parts of what's now Northern Europe, Siberia, uh, and the far eastern part of Russia, and Alaska. So the land bridge, there was a land bridge still connecting Alaska and Siberia. There was a, very likely a connection between Greenland and North America. So the Arctic Ocean at this time is very close to being landlocked. It actually has uh, only a very few, a, a few relatively narrow places where it connects to other parts of the world's ocean, uh, primarily through a, an opening between Siberia and Europe that existed 50 million years ago called the Turgai Strait. So as a result, uh, because it was nearly landlocked and there are rivers and draining into the Arctic Ocean from all these surrounding land masses, uh, it's it's uh, very good evidence that the Arctic was very close to fresh water and salinity. You could almost have dipped a cup in it and had a drink of it uh, and just gotten a very slight salty taste from it. And again, um, consistent also with the idea of mild temperate to probably close to but not quite subtropical conditions during this time frame. So a few conclusions, uh, sort of take home messages. Uh, so the Banks Island Eocene, again, this 50 million year old fauna or assemblage of fossils, uh, we believe records a coastal environment from the Arctic greenhouse period. Sharks dominate uh, this assemblage and they are dominated almost entirely by, again, by the sand tiger sharks. Their tremendous abundance suggests at least the possibility that the area was a nursery or breeding or pupping site for these sharks in the Eocene. Uh, we do have bony fishes, but uh, much rarer than the sharks, just a few scattered bones. Uh, was a little bit more than that, but no, nowhere near the number of, of shark teeth. The one crocodile bone adds uh, an alligator, if you will, and it's probably a crocodile that's closer to the living alligators than to crocodiles proper. Uh, it adds an alligator-like crocodile to the Banks Eocene record. Uh, the records we have from Banks Island all really are significant extensions, extensions of the range of the different groups into the Western Arctic during this time frame. And we always want to have some idea of the range and distribution of these groups uh, during particular slices of time that we're really interested in. And again, uh, consistent with, with other studies on the polar greenhouse period, the high Arctic, based on what we can see from Banks Island, had a mild climate. Uh, summers would have been relatively warm and wet. Winters would very likely have remained above freezing, uh, at least very dominantly above freezing. And the Arctic Ocean, again, was likely uh, near fresh water in terms of salinity and very close to being completely landlocked. So it paints a much different picture, again, uh, as compared to the Arctic that we're used to at the present day. So we want to look at this in, a, in an even larger larger, uh, you know, even larger uh, way of thinking about what's happening in this part of the world today. So again, we, we looked at some of the fossil evidence for the Arctic greenhouse interval peaking at about 50 million years ago. Uh, we can go to the Arctic today and still, again, despite the warming that's happening, we still think of the Arctic as being, and the planet as a whole, as being in an ice house phase of its climate cycle. Again, because there are large ice mass is continental scale ice masses on both Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, but if we look at and kind of project this into the future, um, the trends that we're seeing, uh, the, the rate of warming in recent human historical times suggests that the Arctic could eventually, maybe hundreds of years in the future, revert back to something more like the greenhouse that existed 50 million years ago. So uh, this may have some predictive value for what might be happening in this environment as we go into future decades and future centuries. Uh, this is a, a mural from a museum in Canada, the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, uh, depicting some of the other animals that lived in the polar greenhouse, a couple of mammals. Um, and what we're looking at uh, as, we, as we, again, try to project into the future what might happen we're looking at very dramatic changes right now happening in the Arctic, but they're happening at a human time scale. They're happening on a scale of tens to potentially hundreds of years. So within the time frame of, of human historical thinking, not over millions of years in deep time. So we can 
potentially, it's not something we'll see in our lifetime, but we could potentially, if these trends continue uh, many years into the future, the high Arctic 50 million years ago uh, might again revert back to something, or uh, into the future, might revert back to looking something like the high Arctic environment from 50 million years ago. So there could be dramatic changes happening. And again, the fossils and the study of the environmental context and setting of those fossils gives us clues and the possibility of predicting what might be happening in the future. So a few snapshots from just to give you some more photos of uh, what it's like in that part of the world. Uh, this is the one settlement on Banks Island called Sachs Harbor. <clears throat> Population of roughly 150 people. They are uh, part of the First Nations indigenous people uh, in, on this island. Uh, we reach the island flying in an aircraft called a Twin Otter from the town of Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, which is on the Canadian mainland. Uh, and uh, you're looking basically south in this picture across the Arctic Ocean. This is uh, our field camp uh, several years ago in Olivik National Park. We're a small group. There are only four of us plus a couple of uh, Canadian geologists who, who were also uh, camping with us and working on a separate project. Uh, we arrived there by helicopter. It's about a two hour flight from Saks Harbor to the northern end of the island. So this is our helicopter departing after dropping us off with our supplies and equipment for the field work. Uh, this is my, again, my good friend and colleague, Jalen Everly, and another member of our crew, Brian Schubert. And this all looks very idyllic, I think, you know, this beautiful blue sky, a little blue lake of blue water, rolling tundra, looks wonderful. And, and in almost every way it is, with one notable exception. And we were there right in the middle of summer. We were actually there right over the summer solstice uh, during right in the middle peak part of summer. The one exception that makes us sometimes a pretty challenging place to be in the work is the zillions of mosquitoes, especially if the wind's not blowing. We actually uh, really, really hoped for both colder and windier weather it's much easier to put on layers than it is to deal with swarms of mosquitoes. And they were uh, really a menace at times, uh, especially again when on calm days. It was a bit too warm to really be comfortable wearing mosquito netting over our face. But uh, it, it, uh, again, you know, we tried our best. We had to camp near water because we needed fresh water. We couldn't helicopter in all the water we needed for the time we were there. Uh, we did have some neighbors. Uh, non-human neighbors. Uh, again, this is a, if you look very closely, this is a shot again from our camp with two of our tents, these little dark dots you see in this part of the photo, if you look closely, are the herd of musk oxen that were really pretty much around us the entire time we were there. And uh, they, they did bother us and we tried our best not to bother them, but they are a major presence. And again, uh, as I mentioned, Thanks Island has the highest population density of musk oxen in the Arctic. And the national park we were in, Olivik National Park, uh, one of the main reasons for establishing the park was to provide habitat and, and a good environment for these musk oxen. We also have some other guys coming by. Uh, we had the occasional Arctic fox, very clever, intelligent little canines that would come by. And we had their larger cousins. Uh, we had wolves, these beautiful white wolves. Uh, there were a pack of them living in our area. And uh, when we first started out, I kind of naively thought and asked questions of the National uh, Canadian uh, Parks Canada people about wolf anxieties. And they basically kind of laughed a little bit uh, uh, because I, the first time I went, I didn't, wasn't aware. There are no reported attacks of a wolf seriously injuring someone on Banks Island. They're curious. They would come trotting around, especially if we were cooking, to get a sniff of what we were having for meals. Uh, but they would always stay usually 100 to 200 meters away. And it was just really a privilege to be able to see them, beautiful animals in this beautiful white color. Uh, we did not see any bears. Uh, there are potentially both polar and brown bears on Banks Island, but we did not see a bear while we were there. I've seen polar bears in other parts of the, the Arctic uh, along the eastern side of Greenland, but we did not see a bear while we were there. And uh, they're, they're not commonly seen. We're somewhat inland. The bears tend to be much more around, right along the coastline. 
Uh, again, as I mentioned, we were there during the height of summer. So we had uh, cotton grass uh, flowering extensively across the tundra, which, which was very nice. And the trees that you see in this part of the Arctic, because it's very low, scrubby, rolling tundra vegetation, are primarily dwarf willow, which are only about you know, a foot off the ground, maybe. Uh, one curious kind of sideline to this is our tents were actually much higher than any of the vegetation. So we commonly had birds perching on our tents and running around on top of our tents, including all night long, because we were there during the solstice, so it never got completely dark. So one of the challenges in sleeping there is having these little birds scraping around on top of the tents, hopping around all night long, because perching on top of the tents put them a couple of feet higher than, than they would normally be able to get. Kind of funny, actually. And as I mentioned, we were there during the height of the, the uh, summer, including right over the solstice. So this is a photo that I took at 3 a.m. This nice ring around the sun, a little bit hazy, but uh, it never got dark essentially the entire time we were there. Uh, about three or four in the morning, when it wasn't right at the solstice, it would get a little, almost a little bit like dusk maybe, but it never got completely dark. This also had an impact. You know, fortunately, we worked hard enough that sleeping wasn't always a big issue, but there were occasionally sleepless nights uh, in, in the Arctic. Uh, so the reason I'm taking pictures at 3 a.m. is because it sometimes can be a little hard to adjust to 24 hours of daylight. And I had the somewhat unfortunate uh, choice of uh, having a tent that was mostly yellow, which the sun was shining through. and It was a little bit like sleeping inside a light bulb at times. Uh, Usually not too big an issue, again, because it's physically hard enough work hiking and working and collecting fossils that usually you're tired enough. But again, there was the occasional restless night. So I hope that gives you a somewhat of a picture of, of what it's like to, to work in that setting and a little bit of background on, on why we think fossils from that, particularly from that 50 million plus or minus year old uh, peak are important in the context of understanding the ongoing potential for climate and environmental change in the environment now and, and going forward into the future. So I will end there. I'm not going to read through all the acknowledgments, but you know, this is a project that involved many, many pieces to put together. Uh, I'll especially acknowledge my colleagues Jalen Everly, Howard Hutchison, and also Brian Schubert, who was in an earlier picture, who were our, our small but terrific team that were working up there. And we had support and funding from a number of organizations, uh, most prominently for funding from the National Science Foundation and a lot of support from uh, Parks Canada and universities and museums in Canada. Uh, the fossils are all part of Canadian heritage, so we actually get them on loan for a period to study, but uh, they're not part of the MSU museum collections. They're, they're heritage, uh, heritage uh, resources, if you will, that belong to the Canadian nation and particularly to the First Nations people in uh, the Canadian Arctic. So I will end there and uh, if Nick has a question or two that he'd like to address, I'd be happy to take a turn at that. So thanks again for, for looking in and, and listening and watching today. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Mike. That was amazing. Like I, I know some of the research that you do, but it's always- oh, water, just hard okay, of course, it. yeah. No, but it's just always fantastic to, to hear more about it. And it's just, it's such a cool story to be able to know that people from our museum and people from all over North America are gathering together to learn more about the, the history of certain areas are just, it's so cool. Um, but we have a couple of questions that have rolled in um, so we can kind of ask those. Um, a lot of them, you did a fantastic job of already answering as we were going through the presentation. We got a question and then you'd, you'd answer it a couple minutes later, but we still got a few. Um, so one of them, uh, you, you mentioned that you were there in the high summer uh, when you're on Banks Island. So is there usually kind of a season for fossil hunting for, for paleontologists or specifically for you fossil hunting in the Arctic? Yeah, well, despite uh, you know, the 50 million year old uh, situation with a, a warmer, much more temperate climate, the Canadian Arctic still gets bitterly cold in, in winter. So we do have to go in summer. And also um, there are practical things that many of us who do the work are uh, working at universities. So it's much easier to get away in summer. So uh, uh, there are a few factors. One, despite the fact that uh, it sometimes, as I mentioned, was a challenge, especially initially to get used to the 24 hours of daylight, 
we do have 24 hours of daylight, which means that if we're working at a spot and want to continue, we're not limited by getting dark at say 6 p.m. So, so that does give us some latitude. And we did have some, some late nights uh, because we were doing something that was productive and we didn't want to return to camp. So that's that's one factor, and also just just you know the, the weather is a factor as well. So you know there's a much better chance of, of of having reasonable weather to work in in the summer in that part of the world. Um, there has certainly been field work that's happened there uh, in shoulder seasons, but it mostly ends up being during the summer. It's also, again, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, when people tend to be available to be able to get away and spend a few weeks doing something like that. That makes perfect sense. And also, this is kind of a side question. Is there, there's permit for us in that area, right? So is it physically easier to get fossils out of the ground in the summer as opposed to the winter? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the permafrost layer is buried deeply enough there that it's not a hindrance to the work we were doing, which was mostly collecting off the surface. Uh, we don't really, uh, it, it may not seem like the typical thing that paleontologists do when they're fossil hunting, which, you know, people may have the image of digging giant holes and and collecting dinosaur bones out of excavations. It's not actually that kind of paleontology because again, most of it is surface prospecting uh, because they're small specimens that are weathering out. And uh, they're either, as I said, typically uh, lying on the surface or we also have screen boxes that we, we accumulate some of the sandy material from areas that were producing a lot of fossils and, and screen them through to, to try to separate out small things. So the permafrost is there, it's a good question. Uh, but it's not an issue for our work because, again, we're concentrating mostly on things that are at or very close to the surface where it's not frozen. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so there's also a question just about kind of the, the fossils in general. Once once you get them, what exactly happens? And you mentioned that they are part of the heritage of Canada. So you get them on loan and then they go back to Canadian museums. Um, but like physically, when you gather a fossil, obviously it's easy to, to carry a shark tooth out. But some of those big fossils you were showing, like the tree stumps and things, do those usually end up staying in place? Or do some of those end up going out with you? Like, what is there a size limit on what you can take? Or We didn't. Uh, the, the times I've been up there, we did not collect the tree stumps, and, and actually most of them are left in place because there's a there's a sort of an not sort of there is an aesthetic aspect to it. We don't want to really remove things from those beautifully preserved stands of basically fossilized forest with the stumps and part of the tree trunk that's still in place. Uh, the looser piece of wood, looser pieces of wood have been collected, and that's actually. A research area for another member of the team, Brian Schubert, who's at uh, the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And uh, Brian has collected individual pieces of wood, and those are just very carefully wrapped and, and, and taken back to, for, for study. The shark teeth and the small bones, the typical thing we would do is uh, collect them and, and wrap them in some kind of soft material, uh, some, you know, something, some uh, lightweight foam or bubble wrap or something like that. And then we take them up, uh, we give them a field catalog number, so we keep track of uh, where we found it on what day, which of the localities, because there are you know, several dozen individual fossil localities scattered through that area. Uh, so we, we give them a field number and tie them into a locality, pack them very carefully again in foam and bubble wrap, and then hand carry them back uh, in, in uh, small boxes or, or small crates that we have with us. And then as you said, and as I mentioned, uh, they belong to the Canadian nation, so they're, the official repository is the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, which is essentially the, the Smithsonian of Canada for natural history. Uh, so that's their eventual home, and, and as you mentioned, also we get them on loan for study. Uh, so I still have a few that I'm working on uh, at the museum here, but many of the specimens that I've worked on have now been returned because we finished with them. We finished and published on different parts of this project, and at the point that that happens, the fossils are returned into the collections in, in Ottawa. Super cool. No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so it kind of in line with that too. So we, we talked about gathering up, uh, you know, different fossils and stuff. You mentioned that 99% of the fossils that you found were all from sand tiger sharks, right? Okay. Um, so why would you bother gathering 8,000 sand tiger shark teeth? If you know that they're, they're mostly from the same species, why wouldn't you see one on the ground and just say, oh, we've got 8,000 of those. We, we don't need that one anymore. Uh, well, uh, you know, part of the answer to that is at this point, if we were to go back, we, we likely would not collect a lot of shark teeth because we do have a large sample. 
But uh, this is a question that applies more than, than just to shark teeth, why museums have large numbers of individual specimens. And it's, it's because, you know, we're interested in, in variation. Uh, you know, we, we don't know for sure, we can't predict ahead of time that there are only going to be sand tiger sharks, for example, in this setting. So we want to, and we don't often necessarily commit to a final identification while we're in the field. Um, usually you want to collect things, wrap them up carefully, study them in a more controlled environment when we get back. So collecting a large number of them gives us a, a, a much better idea of the total range of variation. Gives us some idea of the size ranges of the different individuals that were in that ecosystem from you know, small juveniles up to adults. Uh, and it also gives us the possibility of noticing that we may collect some that look different. So it may eventually add to the diversity of, of the, different, uh, the different species that are actually represented there. So it gives us uh, the ability to have a more complete and total picture of what was happening in that ancient ecosystem. Uh, but yes, I mean, a shorter, you know, a shorter version of answering that, I suppose, would be at this point, we'd probably be unlikely to try to collect another 8,000 of those teeth if we were to go back, uh, simply because we think we've probably adequately sampled it now. And it does take some resources in terms of uh, the time it takes to curate and identify and put into little boxes and put in space in the collections and everything. So, you know, there is a reasonable point at which we would go, oh, we have enough of these shark teeth. And we've published our report on them. Uh, so it, uh, we would collect anything that looked novel or different at this point, but we probably wouldn't go to a lot of effort if we were to go back to collect a lot of additional sand tiger teeth. That would, that would be uh, stretching it, I think, beyond the point of what would be reasonable. That's a good question. question. And for the point, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then we just have uh, a couple other questions here too. So uh, you, the, the biodiversity that you're talking about in that area is just super cool where you've got sharks and you talked about how you had a crocodilian, and you've got all sorts of interesting plants and things, uh, at least from the fossil organisms, there's also great biodiversity of things that are currently alive. Um, are there any areas on earth that reflect what Banks Island used to look like 50 million years ago? Is there anywhere you could go on earth that kind of relates to when people can have a a relation of what it might have looked like? Well, in terms of the environment, just in terms of the appearance of the environment, I would think it might have resembled more like something maybe in the Pacific Northwest in the temperate rainforests. But the, uh, the, the diversity of different, different kinds of species present would have been quite a bit different. Uh, some of the, I, I, I was talking about Banks Island, which is again uh, thought to represent a coastal environment, but there's another large island in the, up in the Canadian Arctic I had one picture at the beginning of one of the fossil forests called Ellesmere Island. Ellesmere Island is more terrestrial. Uh, it has more uh, land dwelling uh, representation. Uh, so they find things there like um, there are uh, relatives, uh, there's a large, there are large plant eating mammals. Uh, there are turtles, there are birds, including a large flightless bird, uh, but they are not particularly in the, the the, the large grazing mammal is very distantly related to rhinos. Uh, there's an early primate, actually, an early relative of monkeys that occurs there. Uh, so it's a very different picture than Banks Island. The two islands are <clears throat> significant because they, they, they overlap a little bit, but they really are, they're, they have their own thing going on in each of those islands. So I don't think there's any place that you could go today that particularly would closely resemble the, the, the different kinds of animals that were living in the environment. But in terms of the overall climate and environment, I would say, again, uh, something like a temperate northwestern uh, U.S. rainforest might come close to the general feeling for the climate and the environment. Northwest rainforest, just throw in an alligator and then maybe, maybe you've got... Uh, an alligator and a, and a hippo and a, hippo. You know, a, a few dawn redwoods and so on, and you might have something close. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then um, you just got kind of a last question. You covered a lot of this, but just kind of to generally sum up, why do you think it's so important to keep going to these places and collecting fossils? Like it's obviously cool to know what the earth was like 50 million years ago, but what, what can we learn about it that can be kind of applied to our life today? Right, well, that's a, that's a great question to end with. And I think um, really, you know, that, that there's, an, there's a saying that goes back many years that the path, the, the key to the present is understanding the past and, and the key to understanding what might be happening in the future is to look for 
analogous conditions that existed in, in the past history of the planet as, as far as having predictive value for what we might be heading into. So I think, again, it, it provides a pretty compelling picture of what, uh, it, in effect, you could think of a, the Earth as 50 million years ago already run the experiment of what it's like to have an Arctic that's completely ice-free and with, uh, without freezing temperatures in winter. So if we want to understand the potential impacts and the trajectory we may be on uh, with, with climate change and warming heading into the future, that's a, that's a basically baseline information uh, to be able to understand and to be able to interpret that. Uh, so I think it is important in, in terms of understanding our planet, understanding the dynamics of climate change and the potential future impacts of, of climate change. I, I don't think in any of the lifetimes of the people watching this, that we're gonna see a, a, a temperate to close to subtropical rainforest in the Arctic. None, none of the projections are for it to happen that quickly, uh, but change is happening. And, and the, the environment, the things that live in what's now the high Arctic, and this also applies to the other side of the world and Antarctica, they will change in coming decades and coming centuries. And this at least provides some baseline information for what we might expect those changes to be like, how dramatic they would be, and what the impacts might be. Yeah, excellent. Well, that was a fantastic answer, but uh, just really, really great presentation overall. I really enjoyed it. I hope our audience enjoyed it as well. Um, I learned a whole bunch, I know. Um, yeah, so this is just one part of a whole series of programs that we've had. Uh, we, we also uh, have done interviews with Dr. Dinata Brandt about Michigan geology. Um, we also have some more cultural related things related to paleontology and a few paleontology crafts as well that we've uploaded as part of this series. Um, you can find those videos on our website and on our YouTube channel, so be sure to check those out. Um, and again, thank you so much, Dr. Gottfried, for your time. Uh, it was really fantastic, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, learning more about the fossils of the Arctic. You're very welcome, my pleasure. And, and thanks everybody for watching and everybody stay safe and stay well out there. And hopefully uh, sometime uh, in the not too distant future, the museum will reopen and, and we can recommence doing things in person, but it's great to have these virtual programs going on and hopefully give you folks out there an idea of ongoing work uh, that, that's still happening and ongoing activities at the museum, which, which are still important and still part of our, our efforts at MSU. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.